Murderer's Creek. The name harkens back to the legend of the family of settlers massacred at that mouth of the creek. Moodna, as it is called today, is a form of the Dutch word Moodenaars, or murderers. In 1850, the Erie Railroad branch from Newburgh to the junction with the Erie Main Line below Chester opened for service. A second branch to Newburgh opened in 1869, running from Turner's on the Erie Main Line to Valesgate on the Newburgh branch. Because the second branch was a more direct routing to the main line and New York City beyond, the second branch would always be called the Erie's Shortcut. The two branches would have their most productive years in those halcyon days before the dawn of the auto age at the turn of the new century. With the 20th century American railroads were at the peak of their powers, New York City was about to see the construction of not one, but two of the greatest railroad terminals in the world, the New York Central Railroad's Grand Central Terminal and the Pennsylvania Railroad's colossal Pennsylvania Station. Some 80 miles up the Hudson River, the opening of the Great Bridge over the river at Poughkeepsie in 1889 would usher in the era of the massive railroad yard at Maybrook. Along with the Maybrook Terminal came a flood tide of traffic going east and west. For the Erie Railroad, this prosperity would magnify a growing problem. The main line through Orange County was a series of tight curves and steep grades. It was coming to a showdown with local communities over the growing problem with highway grade crossings. Towns along the line like Goshen were being cut in two with growing railroad traffic passing through the center of them. Railroad Baron E. H. Harriman was always the man behind the curtain. On the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, along with B&O's President Frederick Underwood, E. H. Harriman was part of the brain trust that bought the railroad out of receivership. A third man in the trust was Joseph Marshall Graham. The 50-year-old Graham was a pioneer in railroad grade reduction projects and one of the most renowned engineers of his time. So much so that he would be invited to head up the construction of the Panama Canal. He declined the offer but sent a hand-picked crew of his colleagues along. By the turn of the century, Underwood was president of the Erie. Harriman was on Erie's board of directors. Graham had a long resume of engineering accomplishments on the B&O and other railroads by the time he became vice president of engineering on the Erie in 1904. It would fall upon him to design a new low-grade freight cutoff for the Erie. Gaimar, at the top of the mountain above Port Jervis, is where the Erie's new freight cutoff would leave the main line, skirting Middletown and Goshen. Campbell Hall was where the new line would make the connection to the major artery that Maybrook was to become. At Highland Mills on the shortcut, the branch would connect for the last leg of the trip into Turner's. The Guymar cutoff would cross over on its own trestle at Woodbury, then skirt Scunny Monk Mountain. Where Scunny Monk and the cutoff went their separate ways would rise the trestle that even today is called the longest active railroad trestle east of the Mississippi, rising above the waters of the Moodna Creek. The Moodna Viaduct is impressive just in description, let alone sight. 193 feet high, 3200 feet long, just over 4,000 tons of steel above the quiet farmlands of Salisbury Mills, raised by a cacophony of rivet guns and driven men. Speed in construction was everything. To avoid the usual time and expense of timber framework for scaffolding, a crane on wheels was employed called the Traveler. At the west abutment, the Traveler raised the first pieces of steel into position. Once the first set of girders was topped, track was laid down and the traveler rolled out to raise the next span and so forth. 26 sets of 40 foot spans 80 feet apart. Around 1907 a financial panic swept the nation. 
Construction stopped for a time on the cutoff when construction bonds could not be sold. E.H. Harriman saved the Erie from going into default with a $5.5 million loan. The Moon to Viaduct was completed in January of 1909 with the last piece of the new cutoff completed. Joseph Marshall Graham, the genius behind the new line, died that February of what was called acute indigestion. Perhaps the stress of many projects left to be completed was much of the cause of his ailment. He lived just long enough to see the opening of the new line which the Erie would rename in his honor, the name it carries to this day. Guymar would be renamed Graham, Turner's would be renamed Harriman in 1911, and E.H. Harriman died in September of 1909. To understand Graham's genius for speed and economy, one has to realize that to this day the viaduct has technically never been completed. The towers that hold the track high in the air are 80 feet apart, with girders for a single track running down the center. The plan always was that at some point, as the trade papers explained it, was to come back in about 10 years time and add more steel for a second track. Time would prove that never to be. Conrail would change the railroad landscape forever. Among the rail lines to be scrapped in the name of black ink was the Erie's Newburgh branch. Today only the five miles of the line from Newburgh to Vales Gate remain intact. The rest of the branch is an empty roadbed. One only has to look at the traffic that clogs the roads along the old Newburgh branch route to wonder what might have been. A new era of the modern railroad commuter service has begun. But with the new era, the old Erie Main, and almost a century and a half of Orange County history went to the scrapyard. The old Erie Main survives as a popular rail trail today. The Moon to Viaduct, now over a century old, carries trains as faithfully as the day it opened. But with its age comes the inevitable talk of replacement. What the future holds for this iconic structure, only time can tell.